best definition of irony that I could find was the same one that the federal judge gave in the obscenity case. And they were trying to figure out whether a particular film or publication was pornographic. And the judge said, well, I don't know how to define pornography, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> I think we all feel the same way, number one, about pornography, and number two, maybe even about irony. We know it when we see it. I irony is something that's recognizable. It's part of life. It's part of, it goes on. Uh, throughout our daily lives. And uh, so I thought maybe it would be interesting to find out where the word irony comes from. The word irony comes from an old Greek name for a stock character called an iron. And in old Greek comedy, I'm talking about ancient Greek comedy, the, after the Bronze Age, the Golden Age, Pericles, the 400s, there were two stock characters that appeared in almost every comic uh, performance. It was the Iron and the Alizon. The Iron is the little guy, lowborn, looks like a loser, and the Alizon was the braggadocious, swaggering general or the, the master of the house who seems to have it all together. And those two come together, and the Iron ends up being the one who knows the truth about everything and the swaggering, ragged, braggadocious master gets made a fool of. So there's a twist. And so the character of the Iron became known, uh, uh, the, the word associated with the, the Iron became the word for irony. And it developed uh, since um, the, the time of the ancient Greeks. Now, I, I say irony is something that we come across every day. I'll tell you this. I was a waiter at the Metairie Country Club a long time ago in 1984. So as you can see, my career path is something you might call circular. <laughs> and I remember that one thing I learned when I was a waiter here, going back in the kitchen, the blackboard in the special was Redfish Cubio. And it was the first time I've ever seen Cubion spelled out, C-O-U-R-T-B-O-U-L-L-I-O-N. I had no idea. I heard my mother say redfish Cubion all the time. I had no idea how to spell it or what it really means. Cubion just means short stew. It's a stew that's easy to make. Several years ago, I was at a, a restaurant, and the waiter says, well, that's uh, the abbreviation we use in the kitchen. We just call it redfish Cubion, redfish Cubion. And I said, well, that's adorable. <laughs> it occurred to me, uh, that's why the French hate Americans, uh, <laughs> stuff like that. So anyway, the, the origins of the Iron and the Ar Alizon in Greek dramedy, in Aristophanes, for example, the play The Frogs. The play The Frogs, written in 405 B.C., right during the war, a war with Sparta that just kept going on and on and on. And there was a Dionysian festival and Aristophanes entered this play called The Frogs. And the story of the frogs is that Dionysius and his slave, Xanthius, Alizon, Iron, uh, decide to go down into Hades and retrieve Euripides. Euripides had just died, the great tragedy and uh, playwright. And they thought if they went and got Euripides, they could restore to Athens some of its noble and more traditional values and do something about this interminable war, wars, plural, they keep having with Sparta. And so in order to get down to Hades, they got to get past the centuries. So they decide to go ask Heracles, the Greek version of Hercules, if they could borrow his outfit. And they can fool all the centuries down in Hades. And so, of course, Dionysus gets to wear the Heracles costume, and he brings the slave with him. And as soon as they get down, the sentry recognizes Heracles and said, you're the one who stole Cerberus. And he beats up Dionysus because he's wearing the Heracles costume. And so Heracles tells his slave, well, this isn't going to work. You wear the Heracles costume from now on, 
and I'll be the slave, and I won't get beat up anymore. So, of course, they go to the next century, and the next century is a beautiful woman with a flute. She gives a magic flute to the slave who now has the Hercules costume. And all these great things happen to him. That's irony. That, that is, that's why we have irony now, that kind of stuff. And it continued all the way through, and we know now, for example, Charlie Chaplin. This is a perfect example of an iron. The low-born little tramp who outsmarts the police officers, conks them over the head with a bottle, manages to uh, rip, rip off the department store manager in roller skates. And that, the, the little tramp looks like a loser, but he always gets the girl in the end. And the, you see it, Forrest Gump, for example, you all know the story of Forrest Gump. Looks like a loser. Can't stop winning. Just one wonderful thing happens to him after another. That is an iron, and that is a character based in ancient Greek play. Jersey Kaczynski wrote a novelette called Being There. I don't know if you ever read it. There was a movie made with Peter Sellers. It's a it's a much better and clever, in, in my judgment, version of Forrest Gump. And it has Shirley MacLaine. Peter Sellers, at their best. And Forrest Gump is this guy, he has no idea what's going on, he ends up being an advisor to the President of the United States. They interview him and they say, what do you think about the situation in Vietnam? And he says, well, uh, in, order to, in order for the garden to grow, you must water it. Well, the press just goes wild. The, the, the penetrating genius of this man manages to condense what we really, really need done with a simple statement like that. And of course, he has no idea what he's talking about. Either. He's an iron. Excuse me, let me take a sip of water. Ironic water. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, irony can also be much more sophisticated. It's complicated in, in literary contexts. And one of the examples of, of thought of is T.S. Eliot wrote a poem called The Wasteland. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's an impenetrably difficult poem to read. I have no idea what it means. I had to rely on Cleanth Brooks, the brilliant scholar and author of the seminal work on poetry called Understanding Poetry. Cleanth Brooks a analyzed this poem in a way that I could understand. He's a brilliant guy. Also a graduate of Vanderbilt. Had to slip that in there. That you know. That's about all I have in common with Cleanth Brooks. Anyway, when The Wasteland was written, 1915, World War One was going on. He was living in London. It was a bleak place. They all thought humanity was coming to an end. And... Uh, People had moved away from traditional religions because of industrialization and the popularity of Darwinism and all those kind of things who were at work all across Europe and even into the United States when the wasteland was written. And uh, so that is why it's called the wasteland. London was a very desolate, gray place, and he, Eliot was forsaken for the future of humanity. And so one of the things he did in the poem was to satirize these uh, religious mystics and Eastern religious uh, gurus that people were relying on. People were going to seances, and they were consulting fortune tellers and tarot cards and uh, that sort of thing. So he, would, he thought he would make fun of that. And one of the purveyors of, of this was a crazy woman, this is true, from Russia named Madame Helena Blavatsky. And she had invented this crazy religion called Theosophy, which was this hodgepodge of all this crazy Buddhism and, uh, and, and uh, things that Western uh, formerly religious people were not familiar with and they bought into this kind of thing. And T.S. Eliot was skeptical of that and was uh, despairing. 
that it was happening, that people were relying on this. So in the poem, The Wasteland, there's a scene where the protagonist consults a tarot card reader. And the tarot card reader is reading this man's fortune. And according to Cleanth Brooks, the irony there is that she is purveying a fake religion in the place of real religion. And that ends up being the theme of that section of the poem. And then there's another irony when she deals a card that says fear death by water. And that's ironic because later on we learn that it's only through water that life can be uh, retained and reborn and that we have to find death before we find life again. Now, you got to have a lot of free time. To read that poem, number one, and then number two conclude, oh, how ironic. <laughs> Insanity. But since we're talking about uh, seances and, and the like, and I promised Miss Foley I'd tell a joke. There was a man named Murray the Waiter, and he died. Murray the Waiter died. And on the anniversary of his death, his wife Sheila was forlorn, and one of her friends said, well, why don't we go to a seance and try and talk to Murray one last time, and you can say goodbye on the anniversary of his death. And so uh, Sheila goes to the seance and tells the fortune teller she wants to see Murray the Waiter. And the, and the, the seeress says, well, sit down at the table, and will summon Murray the waiter. And the, of course, the candles are lit, the incense is burning, and she starts chanting incantations, and the table's starting to shake, and they're wondering whether it's going to happen. Is Murray the waiter going to be here? And all of a sudden, poof, Murray the waiter appears on the other side of the room. And Sheila says, Murray, come closer. And Murray the waiter says, I'm sorry, that's not my table. The seamless joke. All right, enough of that. Now, my book is called Quench the Smoldering Wick, as we learned from the introductions from the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah was written during the Babylonian captivity when the aristocratic class of the Israelites uh, were taken to Babylon. And Isaiah was there to preach to them and, and try and persuade them not to lose their faith while they were in this pagan country, the pagan city Babylon. And the, the, the whole quote is, um, it, what, what he meant was, I know you're suffering, but uh, a bruised reed he will not break, talking about God, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings forth justice to victory. So the title is a suggestion that don't lose faith because justice is going to prevail. The irony is you got to read the book to find out if that's true. <laughs> maybe God does break the Bruce Reed sometimes, and maybe God does quench or snuff out smoldering wick. But only when you read the book will you know. That's the ironic. Right off the bat is an ironic statement because we don't know what's going to happen. First sense of the book reads as follows. The irony of having to buy his mistress a Mercedes Benz was not lost on 64-year-old Shale Gimmel. Shale Gimel, we learn, is Jewish. And he's buying a Mercedes Benz. And he's buying one for his mistress. The irony is not lost on him, and it's not lost on us either. So, irony plays a big part in this novel. From the very first sentence, from the very first page, right from the beginning, everything that happens. And the story is four characters, as we, you heard from the introduction. One of the characters is 
a millennial from uh, western Pennsylvania, a suburb of Pittsburgh, who decides to move down to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and help with the recovery because all the disadvantaged people are struggling down here. And she's going to bring some of that justice Isaiah told us about down to the people that really deserve it. And she's a very well-meaning, high-minded, but perhaps naive about what kind of service she can provide. So let's, I thought I'd read from you so we can meet her and find out who exactly she is, what, what she's all about. So bear with her. Farther downtown that morning, Gretchen Sobieski awoke to the sounds of a garbage truck activating its hydraulic track compaction press and the whistles of garbage men signaling that it was clear for the driver to proceed on the morning route. Gretchen lived in a 1900s weatherboard masonette that was a single family dwelling when first constructed, but was now divided in half into two up and down rental apartments. The dwelling was directly across the street from the neighborhood bar, one of dozens that operated in the section of New Orleans known as the Irish Channel. When Gretchen moved to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina from Buckthorn Township, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh suburb, she chose to live in the Irish Channel for its bohemian character, a character that expressed itself in the numerous taverns that were scattered throughout the district. The neighborhood tavern once served as an important social fulcrum when the Irish Channel emerged as a bedroom community for the nearby Mississippi wharves in the late 1800s and early 1900s. See where she's moving into all this. Though they had long since ceased operations, mortuary buildings seemed almost as numerous as the bars themselves. There seemed to be something very immigrant Irish about the neighborhood, which now had the shabby Gothic character Gretchen came to New Orleans to experience. You getting the idea? She savored living on the frontier, so to speak, where lower middle class residents abutted public housing projects and Section 8 badlands. An invigorating atmosphere to her to live a life from which she had been sheltered in the Pittsburgh suburbs by her bourgeois parents. Do you know this girl? Gretchen had selected the Irish Channel as the launching point of her new young adult life that would include a smattering of gutter culture, a little race mixing, some gentile, some gentle iconoclasm, decaffeinated anarchism, free-form poetry, acoustic roots music, climate consciousness, psychotropic mushrooms, a touch of Eastern mysticism, ethnic food, and a floating pantheistic, pantheistic love of nature. In short, a veritable harmonic convergence of everything unconventional and irreverent, all played in a minor key. The Irish Channel had it all, and Gretchen was going to be a bona fide big easy Bolshevik. So I think we know who Gretchen is now. I think she, we know what she came down for and what she's going to do. And the job she got was with a company called Empower the Planet, which was a nonprofit organization that taught lower income people how to install, use, and enjoy um, recycled plants. Uh, What's it, what's it called? You put on walls. You put on what? Sheetrock. Sheetrock. Sheet Recyclable sheetrock that was energy efficient. And on her first day, she's told to go out in the field, they called it a field call, and help the Vido family. The Vido family had a broken water heater. It had leaked all over the sheetrock. It had rotted it out they had called the power of the planet and the power of the planet was then going to go deliver the sheetrock and they teach them about sustainability and recycling materials and all those things. 
So here's what happens when she gets there. You ready for this? She lowered the kickstand on her bicycle, withdrew her purse from the handlebar-mounted basket, and smiled at the gathering children. She began to remove the plastic-coated cable that was coiled around the seat shaft, but hesitated. Locking her bike in front of all these forlorn children might be perceived as a gesture of mistrust. She decided against it. See what's getting ready to happen? Besides, these children would never steal a bike from a conscientious girl who was there to render assistance. No, she decided locking her bike was out of the question. As Gretchen turned her attention to the Vido residence, she observed a line of three or four adult men waiting at an open street-level window. As she walked towards the front door to announce her arrival, the figure of a middle-aged woman emerged from the window with a paper plate holding a large fillet of fried fish and a scoop of potato salad. The woman in the window handed the plate of food to the first man in line in exchange for several dollar bills. At the conclusion of two or three of these transactions, Gretchen spoke politely, are you Mrs. Vido? And she said, what, what do you want? And she said, my name is Gretchen Sobieski. I'm from Empower the Planet. I'm here to take a look at your drywall. Oh, all right. The woman withdrew from the window and opened the front door where the white man... Uh, for the white missionary. In the back, they got cheat rock all over the floor, she said. She said, oh, that's excellent, that's okay. As she climbed the steps leading to the interior of the apartment. I'll just take some measurements and get you all fixed up. Gretchen moved toward the back of the apartment, which she could not help but notice the smell of heavily greasy fish frying and oil. She guessed that she might be witnessing some kind of zoning violation involving the sale of prepared food from a private residence window. She wondered whether she had an obligation to report any of this, or maybe to see a permit or something, but she put those matters aside for the time being. Gretchen set her purse down, withdrew her spring-activated retractable tape measure, and began taking measurements. At least two full 8 by 4 full drywall panels had become waterlogged, from the busted valve leading to the hot water heater. After taking more measurements, Christian took a few steps back to survey the affected area. The damage was not as bad as it looked. As she turned towards the kitchen to deliver the good news to Ms. Fido, she caught a glimpse of a preteen reaching into her purse and extracting her smartphone. That is ironic. She's there to help these poor people, and they're stealing from her. This actually happened to me, and when I was in high school, I was delivering hams to poor people in one of the neighborhoods back behind the waterworks. And we were in a van, and as we were bringing the hams up to the house to deliver the hams, the rest of the neighborhood would be stealing the hams out of the van while we were That's ironic. Ir irony lives with us always. It's everywhere. Another character in the book is a stockbroker. He lives uptown. He's 35. I think he lives maybe on Coliseum Street or right off Jefferson Avenue. He's having an affair with the same woman that the Jewish tycoon is having. In the meantime, he's living in this expensive uptown home, and he has to keep up with the Joneses. Keeping up with the Joneses means you got to have a house with Masker's Jan, you got to have a fishing boat with twin 400 Yamahas, you got to be a member of every club that anyone ever asks you to join. It's expensive, and he wasn't quite making ends meet. He was overextended, and so he started having these wild ideas. One of them was to start buying lottery tickets. So on the way to work, he had just enough time to stop at the, at the, at the 
time saver to buy a lottery ticket. And here's what happens to him. As he pulled out of the driveway, he convinced himself that, that he had just enough time to stop on the way to work to buy a lottery ticket. He pulled into the local Palestinian-run quick shop mini-mart and took his place in line behind the usual fortune seekers, the poorest black inhabitants of New Orleans, waiting like spent electrical vacuum tubes to buy quick play scratch-off lottery tickets with clever Louisiana-themed names crafted to titillate the lowest possible consumer profile. They had titles like Mayhaw Mayhem, Riverboat Rambler, Honey Island Hoot Nanny, Streetcar Name Retire, <laughs> Cochon to Play. The clerks would tear these uh, perforated rolls of metallicized cardboard upon request. It was beyond embarrassing to queue up in these bodegas, surrounded by sail racks of t-shirts, impulse buy display cases, stocked with Philly strawberry blunts, Al Capone sweet cigars, incense, cardio derisers, cookie cut from light cage cardboard in the shape of cartoon Christmas trees, fragrance oils, air fresheners, glass smoking pipes, black nylon skull covers, lighters, energy drinks, pepper spray, prepaid cell phones, prepaid credit cards, fake flowers and sunlit glass test tubes, playing cards, stash trays, Smoker cozies, brass pipe screens, black automotive, hose repair tape, dried meat snacks, WIC, EBT, and snap signs, fake fraternal order of police stick-ons, static cling window lettering kits. All the accoutrements and regalia of urban mischief. So, it's ironic that a guy of his stature sit right smack in the middle of this horrible nightmare, buying a stupid lottery ticket that he's never going to win. And has to look at all this stuff that's on the... You've been to these bodegas. In order to write that passage, I had to go back and photograph it a couple of times. <laughs> to, to get it all in, so much of it is... Just on and on and on. And finally, I said, "That's enough. You got to cut it back. You can't put everything. You got to get on with the book." For heaven's sake. <laughs> There's an example of irony. I'll tell you one more joke that's ironic because it involves the golf course. Because I promise I'll tell you some jokes before we get to my next book. And I'm going to give you a sneak peek of my next book. So I think you'll enjoy hearing. Oh, I hope you will, anyway. Over here on number one, the number one tee, you know, on the golf course. Uh, a guy is teeing up with his friend, and his friend says, that's an interesting golf ball you have there. And he said, oh, that's a special ball. Can't lose it. It's a special ball. And his friend says, well, what about if you go in the woods? Oh, it's a special ball. Beeps. When you go in there, it gets in the woods, you just follow the beep. You can hear it. Can't lose it. It's a special ball. He said, well, what about if it gets dark? Ah, it's a special ball. It glows in the dark. Can't lose it. If it gets dark, no problem. It's a special ball. He said, what about if it goes in the water? And he says, no problem. It's special. It floats. It's a special ball. Can't lose it. And his friend says, where'd you get it? He says, I found it. <laughs> That's irony, right? Okay. I'm going to give you a small taste of my next book. Maybe you'll be interested uh, when it does come out, if I ever finish it. If my Uncle Joe will ever approve it. He has not approved it so far. I don't think he likes it. <laughs> but anyway, it's a story of uh, an Orleans Parish politician who like our friend in the first novel, gets overextended because he has a gambling problem. 
and he spends a lot of time at the racetrack losing money, and he owes child support, he owes alimony, and it's all horrible things, and he can't afford it. But he's been elected to this position as assessor. It's set back at the time where, remember, Orleans Parish had seven different assessors. Insane, but he's one of them, and his district is in New Orleans East. And uh, he, um, excuse me, he gets this wild idea that he is going to try and shake down a Vietnamese convenience store in his district because he finds out they're running an illegal lottery. And he figures if he put pressure on them that he will bring the, 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 the forces of law enforcement to bear on this thing, he can squeeze them a little bit by giving them a jacked up assessment and say, if you want me to lower your assessment, give me some of that lottery money. So that's how our adventure starts. Uh, there is also um, a, 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 po a political operative that we all know, the, the liaison who enables the, the, the bribery system to work. You go through the consultant the consultant gets the money somehow to the um, <coughs> politician. Um, and then there is uh, a gay lawyer who's married. And he's one of those guys that marries for uh, social reasons and for money. And so he gets involved in this marriage to this very overbearing woman but she has social standing. Her father has money. She has connections. And so he's willing to suppress his homosexuality for the sake of this wonderful world of high society and money and clubs and everything. As the story goes on, and he gets involved with this assessor and the, and the, and the convenience store that's running the elite lottery and the political shakedowns that are going on, and the FBI get, gets involved and all that stuff. And he's beginning to think that this, I'm, I'm not being true to myself. I see all these horrible things in the world and they're just not being true. And that epiphany comes over him when his wife takes him to one of these art gallery openings on Julia Street. And it's one abstract painting after another. It's just uh, abstract painting, abstract painting. It's a red blotch. It's a blue stripe. It's a black circle. It's wonderful. So we start thinking about abstract expressionism, and we learn from the omniscient storyteller that abstract expressionism was a product of Madame Blavatsky. Remember, we met her back in... She invented this religion, this stupid religion that she made up out of whole cloth. She ended up being this charlatan fortune teller. She had a stuffed baboon in her seance room. Her husband would rattle the teacups in the case to convince people that were theosophists that there was spirits coming in and visiting upon the thing. And it's, an, it's a dirty little secret of the art world that abstract expressionism as lofty and intellectual as we think of it, they were all, and I mean all of them, Kandinsky, Mondrian, uh, the, the, Ed Reinhardt, Mark Rothko, all, every single one of them was a theosophist, and they believed in this stupid stuff. A dirty little secret of the Guggenheim Museum, the Guggenheim Museum is based on theosophy. Hilla von Ribe, who Simon Guggenheim hired to stock this new form of abstract expressionist art that was so fabulous, it was so Freudian, it was so intellectual, it was so deep and meaningful. You know, the, the, the blue circle. <laughs> Dirty little secret about the Guggenheim. Now, the Guggenheim now sponsors a lecture series that's based on our sensitivity to the environment our sensitivity to indigenous peoples, our sensitivity to the 
disadvantaged and the underserved and the dispossessed and the disenfranchised. What they don't tell you is the fortune that the Guggenheim Museum is based on. Simon Guggenheim's company, started by his father, was a mining company, and they strip mined Alaska to where there was almost nothing left of huge, huge swaths of Alaska. Then they moved to Colorado and Chile and all over the world, scraping copper and gold out of these people. They wiped out six different Eskimo tribes permanently. So when you go to the Guggenheim Museum to a lecture, and they're telling you about how we need to be concerned about indigenous peoples and the environment, you might want to say, well, where did all this money come from? They're not going to bring that up. So in conclusion, I'm sure you're happy to hear those words. <laughs> Go through life when you leave here and start noticing irony because it's everywhere. And I'll tell you one last one I saw several years ago. Right before Carnival Day, they publish the picture of the King of Carnival, right? We've seen him, and they interview him. And how wonderful, fabulous he is, and how tickled he is, and how proud he is, and how it's such an honor to be here. And they say, well, what, 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 is your, what is your reaction to it all, Mr. King of Carnival? And he says, oh, I can hardly believe the enormity of it. Well, what he meant was, I can't believe the enormousness of it. He didn't know that the word enormity means great wickedness, not great size or great pomp and production. He didn't know that. He just said, I can't believe the enormity of it. And I thought to myself, that is irony. <laughs> I don't know why it's irony, but I know it when I say it. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you.